Thank you so much for reading, Abby. Our focus for tonight's sermon is those words of God's command concerning his son in verse 7. Just three words at the end of verse 7. Listen to him. They're great words for us as we begin our year, and they're three authoritative words from God the Father about his son, summing up what it is that he wants for all people everywhere, to listen to the words of his beloved son, his chosen king over all things. Above all the other voices that are going to be vying for our attention this year, this is the voice to listen to. This is what it is to be a Christian in the end. It is the person who listens to King Jesus. In one sense, they're very easy words. Listen to him. That's all it involves. That's what God wants for us. That's his will for our lives in 2019. But in another sense, these are impossibly difficult words. That is because these words come in the context of what Jesus has just been saying. What we're to listen to is his teaching that has just ended in chapter 8. You'll see a flavor of it there in verse 34 of chapter 8 that we've just had read. And calling the crowd to himself with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Words which I'm sure we'll agree are extraordinarily difficult, impossible in fact, for us to do by ourselves. But they are the only way to eternal life, according to Jesus, plain and simple. With such a difficult message, with this message looming for 2019, are we going to listen? Is it worth listening to Jesus if we've never begun doing so? If you're here somebody, as somebody here tonight looking into the Christian faith and what Jesus offers, is it worth to begin listening to what he has to say? Or as we begin 2019, as those who have followed Jesus for a number of years now, what will this year be like? Are we going to continue to listen to Jesus for yet another year, for yet another year to take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow him? Because in our own experience, we'll know very sadly that that isn't always the case. If we've been in RML, our Bible studies for any time, it's so obviously true over the course of the year. Sadly, people in our groups drifting away, no longer listening to the Lord Jesus. I've been on Facebook recently and had one of those friendship anniversaries, which are obviously very, very significant. But those Facebook friendship anniversaries that remind us sometimes wonderfully of friendships that have gone on for years and years, but of other times, people who we once knew, once followers of the Lord Jesus like us, once who were seeking to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him. But yet now, as far as we are aware, have given up on God's command to listen to him. What will it be for us this year in 2019? Are we going to be those who heed these words from the Lord God to listen to him? Is it worth it? God's answer to us emphatically, in the most emphatic way in this transfiguration is yes, overwhelmingly yes. Listen to him. Listen to my son. This is my appointed king and his future is just around the corner. Listen to him. If you're taking notes, that's our first point. Why listen to him? Well, because of who he is and what he brings. In chapter 8, verse 38, Jesus has just concluded his challenging teaching about what it means to follow him. And he says this, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Do you notice the point that Jesus is making about this future? It's worth following him now because of what is coming. One day, soon, there will be this glorious future. And if you are ashamed of me and my words now in this kingdom, in this world, well, then I will be ashamed of you on that great day when I return in my glory, when I return to be the judge and king of all things. Why should we trust that this is true, Jesus? Why should we believe your claim? Can you back it up? Is there any evidence that what you say about this great future to which I need to give my life is something worth doing? Well, the answer from Jesus is an emphatic yes in the most extraordinary way. And the proof begins in verse 1 of chapter 9. 
Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. The claim Jesus is making to that group of disciples is that there are some among them, a few of them there, who will get a glimpse of this reality, of this future glorious kingdom in a moment. They will see Jesus as king at the center of it all. They will see the evidence of that future kingdom brought into the present so they can trust what Jesus says is true. They won't taste death till they see with their very own eyes the kingdom of God come in power. And that is, of course, exactly what happens to Peter, James, and John, beginning in verse 2. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Here is the beginning of the evidence, the proof of what Jesus says about his promised future is a reality, something that can, get, that can be touched and seen. And the glimpse of the future reality begins with Jesus' appearance. In a moment, he goes from his ordinary appearance to being transfigured. Exactly what that means, we don't quite know, but there is some change in his appearance, still recognizable to Peter, but nevertheless, somehow glorious and different. But not just himself, also his clothing. We read here, he is radiant, intensely bright, white clothes. His clothes are bleached as no one on earth could bleach them. This is the ultimate personal detergent. This is from the laundromat of heaven. This is heavenly clothing because we are in the presence of the heavenly king. And his kingdom has been brought vividly and personally in front of Peter, James, and John to see. This glimpse of the kingdom involves the changed appearance of Jesus. It involves also the attendants who are with Jesus. Did you see them there? Moses and Elijah, verse 4. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Again, confirmation of what we're seeing, this future kingdom of God. Moses, as we know, the one who in the Old Testament was the great leader of God's people, but dead and buried, long dead and buried. But now he, here he is, alive. This is the life of the resurrection beyond the dead. This is a taste of the kingdom to come. And there also is Elijah. Elijah, who was the great reforming prophet of Israel, who called the people back to obedience to God. Elijah, who didn't actually die, but was taken up to be with God before death, to heaven. But now heaven has been brought down, and heaven is present before Peter, James, and John, so they can see it with their own eyes evidence of what Jesus has been saying, that he really can be trusted about this future. And poor Peter, of course, is lost for words. We can sympathize with him. In verse 5, he says, Rabbi, uh, uh, it, it's good that we're here. Um, let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Just think about it. Here you are in the presence of your heavenly Lord, attended by the greatest leaders of all your history, and what you say to them is, do you want a bit of shade? It's a very strange thing, but he's so overwhelmed, so surprised, and well might you expect it, because what he is seeing is not ordinary. Peter isn't some gullible, pre-scientific peasant. Peter knows what is normal, and this is not normal. He saw it with his very own eyes. He saw heaven brought to earth. He saw the glory of the Lord Jesus. He saw resurrection power in front of his very eyes. This is the kingdom of God come in power as Jesus promised, evidenced by his appearance, evidenced by his attendance, but ultimately and climactically in this passage, evidenced by the affirmation of Jesus by God's very own words. Verse 7, God's voice breaks in. A cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Twining's tea, Walker's shortbread, ferry washing up liquid, they all have something in common. And that is that they are royal warrant products. They're all products that have the insignia of the queen or the emblem of the coat of arms printed on them and have those words by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen, giving the queen's stamp of approval. But rather cheesily, what we have here is ultimately something much greater, the heavenly royal stamp of approval, the, the royal warrant from the divine king, 
not by the queen about detergent, but about the king of heaven regarding his son. In the Old Testament, when God appears, he appears in a cloud. And here again, he does the same. The cloud overshadows the whole experience. And you can imagine it. There it is. And God's voice breaks in. This is my beloved son. If we've been in Mark's gospel, we'll remember we've heard this word before. Back in chapter 1 at Jesus' baptism. God's voice broke in back then with the very same words. You are my beloved son. And as Charlie referred to earlier on in Psalm 2, this is the word about God's king. God's son is the title given to that one unique, long-awaited, long-expected, universal ruler of God, appointed to be the ruler over all people and all things, the one to whom every knee should bow one day. And what God is saying is that this Jesus is that one. He is that king. He is my son. And we'll know that in Mark's gospel, following that great announcement in chapter one, we have chapter after chapter after chapter of Jesus demonstrating in his life and through his actions and through his teaching that he is this one. There's no way about it. He is the one with all authority and power and compassion. He proves himself to be the son of God that God declared him to be. And those of us who are familiar with Mark will again know that at the same time, despite all the evidence, time and again, even Jesus appearing before the disciples and saying, I am, these disciples just don't get it. They don't understand who he is. They're blind because of their sin. And we nearly give up hope that they will ever get it until finally, surprisingly, the verses that we just had read before, chapter 8, verse 29, Peter somehow understands. And Jesus said to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And Peter gets it. You are the Christ. That is, you are the king. You are this son of God. But that moment of insight is so short-lived. As soon as Jesus begins to change his teaching, the tone is moved. Lesson one is over. Jesus is king. But then Like any good teacher, Jesus moves to lesson two in the second half of Mark's gospel, beginning with teaching about his death and his resurrection, that he must suffer in order to be the true king. He must die to be the son of God. And Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. Verse 32 of chapter 8, this can't happen, Jesus. I won't have it. You cannot die. You won't be this kind of king. And the question remaining for us at this point is, is he right? Has Peter somehow got it right? Has Jesus lost the plot? Has he gone off message and lost his way? You understood for eight chapters, Jesus, and I finally understood what you were getting on about. You are this glorious, all-reigning, all-powerful king. You are the Christ. But now you speak about your death. Now you speak about your suffering. What are you saying? You've lost it. But at the very point where we might be tempted to align ourselves with Peter, God steps in in this unmissable way and reaffirms the words at the baptism. No, says God, just as at his baptism, this is my son. Nothing's changed. This is my chosen king still more than ever. And verse 7, listen to him. Yes, listen to him, especially about what he is saying about his death and what it means to follow him. And listen to him is the point, supremely and exclusively above all, so that no other voices clamor in or take any space for us. The supremacy of Jesus is what is going on, I think, in verse 8. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. And that's the point, I think. Moses and Elijah, those pillars of Old Testament religion, Moses, the author of the law, the first five books of the Old Testament, Elijah, that great reforming prophet calling God's people back to him, but they're gone. And all that is left is Jesus. Listen to him. All of their words were only ever preparation, pointing towards what he had to say. 
And still Peter doesn't get it. He says, rabbi or teacher, verse 5. And he seems to want to give them the same accommodation, each their own tent. But God won't have it. No, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. And only him. Listen to him. Jesus' appearance, Jesus' attendance, Jesus' affirmation from God the Father, all evidence for us, for us now, so that we would do what God says, that we would listen to him. So is it worth us in 2019 being those who continue to listen to Jesus? Well, God's message to us is absolutely yes, because this is my son. And this is my son as he is presently in his reign over my kingdom. You see, for Peter at that time, that was a glimpse ahead of time for what would happen after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. But do we see that that is actually what Jesus is like now, presently? All of that has happened in history. Jesus has died. That came true. Jesus has come back to life. That came true. And Jesus is now risen and ascended with God the Father. And this glorious picture that we have here of Jesus is one to keep in our minds because that is who Jesus is now, presently. This is the supreme, ruling, reigning, all-conquering, all-majestic, all-glorious Lord of all things. And he's the one we are called to listen to. It's no ordinary Jesus, meek and mild. Not Jesus in his weakness and his suffering. Not Jesus of the children's book pictures. No, this is the reality. The reality that Peter saw and has now entered into, that he now enjoys. This is the reality that is just around the corner for us, if we're Jesus' followers. It may seem a long time, but in eternity's time, it's just a few seconds. We're in the last minutes of overtime in the game of world history. And the whistle is about to be blown. And either we will step into eternity at our death in just a few moments and meet this King Jesus, this glorious one, or he will return in just a moment and the whistle will be blown and we will be in his presence forever. Is it worth listening to him? Well, yes, it is. Listen to him because he is God's son and he is the one who now presently rules over this reality, which is soon going to consume all things everywhere. We don't really have much time for it, but I do just briefly want us to turn to the content of what we are to listen to. The things that uh, we are to listen to are those things that Jesus has just been speaking about. We've looked at the why we ought to listen to Jesus, because of who he is as God's son, and because of this reality of the kingdom of God just around the corner that he brings. But there is also the con- the content of what he wants us to understand. And if we're taking notes, that is, in the first place, the message about his cross. When God says to us, listen to him, very specifically and very importantly, he wants us to understand the centrality of Jesus' death. It's there in verse 8, at chapter 8, verse 31. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. We'll know that Jesus is speaking about his upcoming execution on a Roman cross. The place that he's heading to is Jerusalem and that is the place of his death and Jesus knows it. But Jesus says, this is what is going to happen to me and it must happen. I must suffer and I must die. Jesus has come for this very mission, he says. This is at the very heart of what he came to do. This is, in fact, what makes him king. The climax of this gospel is Jesus on the cross. And as you read that account, what you see is actually it is an enthronement. The moment at which Jesus is most kingly is the moment with human eyes that he looks most unimpressive. It is on the cross that he is crowned as king. And what we must understand, according to Jesus, and what God wants us to understand is that as we listen to him, what we must find at the very center of his teaching is the news about his cross, his death on our behalf. There is no crown without the cross. 
or more cheesily, the only way to mansion house is via King's Cross. <laughs> Peter hates the idea. Peter hates the idea. And we saw it from his response in verse 32. He takes Jesus aside, as we've seen, and we re he rebukes the king. I won't have you be king in this way. But Jesus is equally sharp in his response. We'll be familiar with it in verse 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. We've got to take note. Any form of Christianity that wishes to bypass the necessity of Jesus' death at its very center, as the very crux of what he came to do and what he teaches and what we need is merely human. No, no, actually worse than that, it is satanic. The cross is at the very heart of everything Jesus has come to do, and we hate it by nature. We hate it because of what it says about us, because it says that we need somebody to die in our place. We need somebody to suffer God's judgment for the sins that we have committed. But the point is, as we go on in Mark's gospel, that this death, and only this death, is the way that anyone can have God's wrath satisfied. Jesus is our substitute. He satisfies God's wrath, his just indignation against us for all our wrong, and he satisfies it on Jesus. Before he dies on the cross, we'll know Jesus drinks that cup, the cup of wrath, which is a symbol in the Old Testament of all God's anger against human sin. Jesus asks the Father, is there some other way is there some other path that I can tread to be the king, to be your faithful son? And God says no. And we'll know if we're familiar with that passage that Jesus is the one who will drink that cup of wrath to the very dregs. He takes the judgment that we deserve. It's poured out on him so that those of us who would follow him can enter in behind him through this life and into his eternal kingdom, safe in the knowledge that all the wrath that is due to us has been absorbed by him, the one who stands and walks ahead of us. Listen to him about his cross, but also finally listen to him about his call, his call to follow. And that's what Jesus goes on to say and to speak about. This pattern, this way of life, this trailblazed path that Jesus has gone ahead of for us. Verse 34 of chapter 8. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. To deny oneself isn't to give up chocolate or something petty like that. That word deny comes up again at the end of the gospel when Peter is confronted by that servant girl and three times he denies Jesus. I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know you. But to deny oneself is to do the opposite, is actually to affirm that we know Jesus, that we belong to him, to say no to self and instead yes to Jesus, to align ourselves with him and his priorities. Take up one's cross, Jesus says. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. The cross, that instrument of torture, speaks of our own death, putting to death our own priorities and desires and ambitions, and instead replacing them with what Jesus wants for us. Well, verse 35, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. To lose our life, to give up on our own personal kingdoms, and instead, instead throw our lot in with the Lord Jesus and his kingdom, to make the progress of his name and his gospel the very ambition of our lives. We may think it is the preserve of the heroic Christian in the heroic Christian biography, but Jesus says, no, this is ordinary. This is ordinary discipleship. If you would follow me, you need to be the one who will lose his life for my sake and the gospel's. And it will look very ordinary and mundane in most of our situations. It's not the stuff of the great biography. It's the stuff of daily resolve, 
of the unremarkable situations that Jesus has put us in. Whether we're single or married, students or working in a high-flying job, whatever we happen to be, where we're from, if we're English or from somewhere else, for all of us, wherever God has put us, to give up on our own ambitions and instead resolve to live for Jesus and for his gospel. Because after all, verse 36, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Answer, nothing. There is no profit. It is the ultimate bad investment to achieve our ultimate ambition in this world, reach the very top of whatever career or sphere of life that we have as our secret ambition, gain this whole world, but then, in just a moment's time, find ourselves having lost our soul for eternity, finding ourselves cut apart from Jesus and from his kingdom. It is a very stark contrast when God says, listen to him. The choice is black and white. It's only two options. Live for self now and save life. Result, lose life for eternity. Live for Jesus now. Lose your life for his sake and his gospel. Result, find yourself with him in his eternal kingdom. And that is what it means to listen to him. That's the choice we face. And the question is, is it worth it? Well, according to God, it is We need to cast our minds back as we close to that vision that we see in the transfiguration because that is who Jesus is now. That's the one who is calling us to listen to him. That is the one who reigns over this eternal kingdom. It's a reality just around the corner. Listen to him because this reality is there and it awaits us. And listen to what he says about taking up our cross and following him. As we read on in Mark's gospel, we'll soon discover that this call is impossible for us to follow. With man, this is impossible. By ourselves, we cannot do it. But that is where what we've said about the cross is so important. That is why in Jesus' teaching, the cross comes first before the call to follow him. Because it's by his cross that he has already taken the punishment for all our failures for our failure to take up our cross and follow him. All the ways that we will continue now, in the past and in the future, to fail to be the followers that he calls us to be. But his death has covered for all of those failures. Not only is he the one who has taken the penalty for our sin, he's also the one who now empowers us, who restores us, brings us back day by day, and gives us the strength to begin to follow him on that path to glory. I've said it a number of times, but my favorite part of Mark's gospel is in chapter 16 of Mark's gospel. When after Jesus has denied, after Peter has denied Jesus three times, and we expect him to be cut off forever, Jesus makes a very special point to the messenger to say uh, that the words that are said from the messenger are tell the disciples and Peter to come and meet the Lord Jesus. That is that Peter is restored back into fellowship despite all of his failure. And that is true for us. Those of us who are called to follow the Lord Jesus, an impossible task, yet he restores us time and time again despite our failure. And he restores us and now empowers us by his cross to follow in this necessary pattern, this pattern of losing life now to save it later. And in just a flicker of time, this promise is what will be true. We'll be welcomed into his presence, into his glorious kingdom. And at that time, we'll know that this was true, that it was worth it to listen to him. Is it worth listening to Jesus in 2019? Well, according to God, it is absolutely. This is to be a year where we listen to him, trusting that as we do, we will find ourselves in the presence of this great king in just a moment of time. Let's pray. Lord God, these are simple words from your mouth. Listen to him, yet extraordinarily, impossibly difficult for us. Yet we pray that you would enable us 
to see what lies ahead, the reality of this future kingdom, the reality of your son's present reign. And we pray that this year, in those moments of challenge, that you would cause us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, knowing that you have in your son, the Lord Jesus, paid the penalty that we deserve for all our sins and now empower us to follow him. Amen.